qualities of true motherhood. And it says the qualities of true motherhood are many. And today in the story that we're going to be reading about, it's about a woman named Rizpah. And it tells of the qualities that are manifested through the harsh circumstances that she faced. Our golden text is found in Proverbs 23:25, And it says, Thy father and thy mother shall be glad, and she shall bear thee. And she that bear thee shall rejoice. At 16, I'm sorry. May 16, because they mixed it up, this should be the Mother's Day lesson. So in your books, it'll be uh, page 64. May 16th, I'm sorry. I should have mentioned that. So next Sunday will be the other one that we're the head for today. Actually, I didn't, Brother Jamie did. <laughs> okay. Oh, no, that's okay. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned it. I forgot to say it. But again, the golden text is, Thy father and thy mother shall be glad, and she that bear thee shall rejoice. Our scripture reading is in Second Samuel 21, 8 through 14. And this tells us a story of this lady. It says, But the king took the two sons of Rizpah, the daughter of Ai, whom she bare unto Saul. These were uh, children of Saul. Armani and Mephibosheth and the five sons of Michael, the daughter of Saul, whom she brought up from, for Adriel, the son of Berzali, the Mahalathite. And he delivered them into the hands of the Gibeonites, and they hanged them in the hill before the Lord. And they fell all seven together, and were put to death in the days of harvest, in the first days in the beginning of barley harvest. And Rizpah, the daughter of Ais, took sackcloth and spread it for her upon the rock, from the beginning of harvest until water dropped upon them out of heaven. And suffered neither the birds or the, of the air to rest on them by day, nor the beast of the field by night. And it was told David what Rizpah, the daughter of Ai, the concubine of Saul, had done. And David went and took the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan, his son, from the men of Jabesh Gilead, which had stolen them from the street of Bethshan where the Philistines had hanged them, when the Philistines had slain Saul in Gilboa. And he brought up from thence the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan his son, and they gathered the bones of them that were hanged. And the bones of Saul and Jonathan his son buried they in the country of Benjamin and Zelah, in the sepulcher of Kish his father. And they performed all that the king commanded, and after that, God was entreated for the land. The most important occupation on earth for a woman is to be a mother, a real mother to her children. You don't get a whole lot of glory in it. There's not a lot of recognition necessary in it. But it takes a lot of grit and grind. But there's no greater place to do ministry position, power, than that of a mother. We can have a lot of influence, not only on our children, but upon others when we live as a godly mother. We can influence them as far as their lifestyle and what their beliefs are. Uh, you know, a young child is very easily influenced by others. They're just innocent, so... We have a great responsibility to our children um, to live before them a life that's holy and to give, be an example of someone with good morals, principles. You know, today, I'm not so sure that that's being done, you know, in a lot of homes, unfortunately. And as a result of that, you can see how some children are today. They, they're... 
get away with everything. They're not disciplined. They're not, you know, given any kind of example to follow what go, whatever goes, goes. And you can see that in our youth. Not, not all of them, but in some of them you can really tell whether they've had a home life that's been a good example. In the tragic yet telling story of Rizpah and the death of her sons, you can see the true qualities of motherhood exemplified in and through the grit and grime. At the death of her sons, though it was not of any sin that she had done, they all, uh, all that survived in Rizpah's heart was maternal love, and that would remain long afterward that they were con you know after their were their consciousness was gone her love still remained and today we have an example of motherly love that we may properly appreciate that love and influ- the and the influence that a mother can have toward her children and you know they do watch everything and they m- mimic and mock you know fathers mothers they watch and they hear. And when you think they're not listening or they're not hearing, they hear. Because sometimes you can say, well, where did you hear? Well, you said. I heard Dad say. So they're listening. They're watching. We want to preserve that legacy. This may challenge all mothers to strive to achieve the level of dedication, and it will challenge the rest of us to express appreciation for it. Our lesson is is really a sad situation and kind of an unusual situation. And it may cause us to wonder about the lasting commitment that a mother has for her children. And we're just going to highlight these characteristics that Rizpa had, and which are true of all good mothers, and which we can see manifested in difficult times that she had. What is a mother? Is it merely a female who's taken uh, advantage of God-given capabilities to bear a child? Can the words be defined in, in simple biological terms? Can we determine the meaning by simply looking at the outward manifestation of a woman's ability to bring forth another human body from her own? No, there's a much deeper significance involved in the word mother than we can really realize look at the meaning of the word mother in european word for mother it was um mater and i've heard that pronounced mater too and i couldn't help but think mater you know in in south georgia we, a mater was go get the mater out of the garden and cut it you know but the, so I guess it correct pronunciation should be modern. But um, it was based on a syllable ma, which uh, is also English for mama. And they later transformed that to mater, modern. And in German, I know my husband was German, and his uh, mother they call her Mutter, Mutter. And the Dutch and the Swedish, they say motor, so it's... But I know one word that my dad insisted that we call my mother, and that was mother. We couldn't call her mom, ma, mama, but we had to call her mother. That was important to him. He felt like that was uh, respect, showing her respect and honor, and that's why he called his mother, mother. He was required to do that. And, I, you know, I... Kids nowadays, my my kids, when when they want me to go see something they're doing or want to tell me something, the two of them together at the house, my son and my daughter, they start this, ma, mama, 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 <laughs> until I go in there. <laughs> but my dad always insisted on us saying mother. The word mother carries with it an idea of that which gives birth to something. And examples would be like a mother cell that separates, you know, and, and reproduces by division. Mother country, which is a person's original country. 
a mother's mark, which they consider to be a birthmark. A mother tongue is like a native language, and mother of pearl is a substance that they used, uh, you know, to make buttons and other things too. Webster defines a mother as a woman who has born a child. But there are many aspects to motherhood besides that, the biological. There's emotional, spiritual, psychological as well. And a doctor knows that his patient's psychological problems may affect his physical condition as well. And so we cannot exclude one human characteristic from another. They are all interconnected. And, you know, that explains a lot of uh, what you see now in children in, out in the world is <clears throat> how they've been affected psychologically through the years affects not only physical, but how they respond and react to things, too. It's, it's, it has a great deal to do with that. And you know how, how your mental can affect your physical. It can drag you down. So where your mindset is, you know, it affects the body. Spiritually, emotionally, it affects everything. There's a purpose, purposeful design in the creation of a woman to bear children. Uh, is there some meaning in the visible signs such as the light, bone, or muscle structure? I believe there's a meaning in these differences. A female acts like a female not because of social conditioning or upbringing, but because of specific divine design. God created woman, female. So by design, by God's design, a mother is a woman who is connected to her children Physically, but also emotionally, spiritually, and psychologically. A woman may have a child, but not necessarily be a true mother to the child. You know, there are mothers that abandon their children. Mothers that don't want their children. Women that abort their children. In every sense of the word, in the story which we are about to examine we find a mother who was totally connected to her children and stayed committed to that responsibility even beyond the point of death. Now, when you talk about Respa and the background uh, uh, that she had, she was one of Saul, King Saul's concubines, which gave her the right to a lot of privileges. She uh, had a lot that the majority of women would not normally experience. She had the best of everything. She had all the comforts. She had her needs met with great detail. detail. She became a mother and raised two sons under the uh, protection of that very king, King Saul. Many years pass, and, of course, Saul dies, so she loses her, her uh, husband, and then David becomes king of Israel. It happened that a grievous famine, was lasted, which lasted for three years, fell upon the land during the early half of David's reign. And this was sent because, it says for Saul and for his bloody house, because he slew the Gibeonite, Gibeonites. See, he made a, an a, agreement that... Um, it said, David inquired of the Gibeonites what they demanded, but I was going to, there's a section here. I can't see it right now, but, but he was not, they were not supposed to slay the Gibeonites. They were not supposed to touch them. And David had an agreement about that when they were warring against one another. And um, they were killed. So because of that, then all this fell upon 
Saul's sons, and also this famine, which was uh, lasted for three years. It was the reason because they disobeyed God. <clears throat> and then when David asked the Gibeon, uh, Gibeonites what they demanded as a result of what happened, what they demanded as as uh, to compensate for the wrong that Saul had done, and the only thing they, the main thing they said, they wanted uh, seven of Saul's sons killed. That was their compensation. So David delivered them, not just the two sons of Rizpah, but the five sons of Merab, who was Michael's sister and the wife of Adriel. Michael adopted and brought up the boys under her care. These the Gibeonites put to death. They hung up their bodies before the Lord at the sanctuary at Gibeah. Can you imagine a mother seeing her sons hung up and killed and just hanging there? But what does Rispa do? She goes away from all those comforts that she had in the kingdom, goes away from all, all that probably comfy bed, had a nice bath area, and all the comforts, food, whatever she needed was su supplied for her. But she left all that, went to this place where the bodies were hung, her sons, and she took her place on the rock of Gibeah. And it says possibly she might have been there five months because it was from the beginning of the harvest until the next rainy season. And she watched all that time, now five months, sitting there, seeing her sons 24-7. And she watched the suspended bodies of her children to prevent them from being dev devoured by beasts and birds of prey until they were taken down and buried by David. Can you imagine sitting there? I'm sure it, it was a, a pleasant smell. How awful it must have been. Not it, just the fact that these were her sons. They were dead. They were decaying. Yet she stayed there, like I said, every day, 24-7. Through the smell... She had no comfort from anybody. It doesn't say she did. I'm sure she suffered daily anguish every day for those sons. No support from anyone. Just her sitting there watching over her sons. And there's no telling what she uh, might have faced, you know, even risking her life against birds of prey and other animals that would want to come and take the bodies and and, you know, destroy the flesh off of them. She, she wasn't going to have that. Now, that's the mother's love to the very end. The very foundation of civilization is the family, and the heart of every family is a loving mother. A mother's love is sacrificial and enduring. We can see this even from the very beginning of the prospect of motherhood. Every woman who places great value on human life is willing to enter into pain and suffering just to bring that life into the world. And I put willing to, question mark. <laughs> you don't know what you're getting into sometimes. <laughs> but it's worth it all when you see that, that child, and that young baby. It's just... a amazing and when it's talking about a mother's love being sacrificial I can't help but think I'm sure there's many times I've I, I don't mean to toot my own horn but but I'm sure there's all mothers are like that my mother I know was like that but you know when you prepare food and you have a certain amount and and usually uh, the father gets fed the children get fed and the mother waits, and even if the child, I want that last, you know, go ahead, you eat it. I don't want it anyway, you know. <laughs> so you, you know, give 
for your children, for your family, not just your children, but your husband, your family. They give, you know, sacrificially, sometimes doing without when it's not even noticed, you know, that they're doing without. Rizpa, who was a concubine of Saul, she was no different. Despite the circumstances under which these sons were born, she loved her sons. She bonded with them at an early age and was able to watch them grow from young boys into strong men. We are not supplied with the details of her early life, but all indications point to the suggestion that Rispa and her sons had a good relationship and that she was a devoted mother. Rispa's love, motherly love can clearly be, be seen in the sacrifices that she made in order to preserve the dignity of her sons at their death. We find that Rispa placed herself in a very vulnerable position in order to accomplish the task of demanding a closure to the whole terrible ordeal that had taken place. As I said before, she left the comforts of home that she had. She camped beside the bodies of the seven sons of Saul. See, it wasn't just her two. She was there for all seven. She suffered the hardship of living in her homemade tent upon a rock. She could not bear the thought of her sons hanging there for the vultures to tear to pieces and devour. So she determined to keep watch over them and drive them away. She watched with great vigilance and devotion. Can you imagine? I, I would assume that she probably got almost no sleep if you're watching over them like that to keep other things away from them it has to be a constant watch because you know even when you're driving down the road and you see a vulture after something on the road well when you drive by they may scatter off but seconds they're back there again you know you shoo them off and they're back you shoo them off and they're back so I can't imagine that she had any rest during all that time. Lack of sleep. She may have had some sustenance, but, you know, it don't say whether she did, but I'm sure she probably had some. But as far as rest and sleep, there was none. That's, that's devotion. A mother's loyalty. Loyalty is constancy, faithfulness, allegiance, and dedication. All of these qualities can be used to describe a true mother. For an extended period of time until rain fell from the sky to end the drought, Rizpa watched day and night. What a picture of loyalty. A mother's devotion endures through years of hardship and trial and test. When she's unappreciated or even degraded, or neglected, the mother clings and hopes. You know, even when sometimes um, what you do to, don't seem to be noticed or, you know, really care. Sometimes, you know, uh, I, I've seen where, where children don't appreciate what the, their mothers do for them, and it's never enough. You know, they're always wanting more all the time. And sometimes they get neglected. Sometimes they get degraded, even by their own families, by their own children. When she's abandoned by all, she does not abandon them. She still loves them. The penitentiaries report that when someone is sent there, friends begin to visit less. And then relatives begin to visit less and then the father begins to visit less but mothers stay and visit with everyone when everyone else stops and has seemingly forgotten what does this tell us it tells us who has the deepest love on earth 
the mother. Never forget the mother of your life, for she has given life to you. Rizpah was not responsible for the sin of Saul, which had brought about this whole ordeal. The famine that was upon the land was sent because of Saul and his bloody house because he slew the Gibeonites. That's where I was trying to find a while ago. A covenant with the Gibeonites had been made many years earlier in Joshua 9, 3 through 27. Saul had violated this covenant. In addition to this God-sent punishment, the Gibeonites demanded the death of those seven sons of Saul. She bore some of the consequences of that sin in spite of her innocence and the seeming innocence of her sons and in spite of the terrible circumstances brought by by wrongdoing of others, she stayed loyal to her sons. She didn't forsake them in the hour in which they needed her the most. This was the hour in which the children could not speak for themselves. They needed someone because they were helpless. Let us consider the fact that a mother's loyalty to her children should not depend on whether or not she agrees with the behavior or the choices that her children may make in life. You know, you stay loyal to them, even though they may do bad things. You still love your children. You always love your children. And you don't always agree with things they may do, their lifestyle maybe. But it doesn't take away the love that you have for them, the care that you have for them. And I've, I see a lot sometimes on TV where uh, some of these police shows or what. First 48 or whatever, where um, these children have committed these terrible crimes, but the mother's always, oh, my child would never do that. Not my child. I learned a long time ago not to ever say, my child will never do. You pray that they never do anything bad. And you try to raise them that way, but you never say they never will because you don't know what they might do. But you still love them, even though they make mistakes, even though sometimes you're disappointed and sometimes they make you cry, you still love them. And, you know, if, if you have that love, for, like a mother's love, that uh, faithful and loyal love, you'll love them regardless doesn't mean you love what they do. <clears throat> I, I try to talk sometimes to my nieces. I was just talking to Sister Pearl about that this morning. My sister is, has passed. She passed away in 2013. She has three daughters, and um, their lifestyle is not good. And uh, they call me every so often, and, and uh, I pretty direct with them about their life uh, and I said I, I'm, I'm not trying to be m- mean uh, you probably wished I wouldn't say this I said but you know I'm going to say it I said but all three of you need the Lord you need to change your lifestyle I don't agree with their lifestyle I don't believe you know I, I don't approve of what how they live and what they do but I still care about the soul and God's the same way God cares about that soul not the sin. He hates the sin. We should hate the sin. If we're a Christian, we should hate the sin. But not the soul, the person. We should love them and pray for them. That's what we're here to do is to pray for them and love them, you know, regardless. This should be, this could be the very thing. This, this, this is the answer right here when you, let's, someone know that you still love them even when they know they're not doing right it says this could be the very thing that God will use to bring children back into their proper relationship with Christ and the family a true mother is loyal to her children from conception 
until death and beyond. She is loyal when the children are not able to speak for themselves and when they are not able to defend themselves. She will care for them when they are not able to provide for themselves in any way. And, and that's true, too. You know, some some children are, are kind of like yo-yos. You send them out and they come back. You send them out and they come back. <laughs> but, but as long as I have a home, if they need to be, it's their home. There's always a door open for them to come home. And you care for them no matter what. Rizpah's intense maternal love led her to seek the safety and honor of the dead. Others in this age would do well to seek the safety and honor of the living, born and unborn. Abortion and partial birth abortion are some of the greatest sins of America. Someone who has become a Christian after an abortion needs special help because you can imagine it's hard for them to deal with 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 that I, I just I can't even comprehend I'm sure it it stays heavy on their minds a lot so you know if we ever come across anyone like that we should show them all the love and support that we can give them and, and try to help them through it the sin can be forgiven but it's difficult for them to live with that memory so we should do our best to help them and help them live for the Lord. A mother's courage. We, we've talked about a mother's love, a mother's loyalty, and this is about mother's courage. What mother would go out into the wilds of the countryside and pitch a tent to face birds and beasts of prey? Rizba did that. And what mother would leave all behind to voluntarily subject herself to possible danger of life and limb for the benefit of her children? She did that also. There is no doubt that in times of emergency and desperation, women, and especially a mother, can and will display the most impressive courage. You see that happening a lot where it, they're amazing. I mean, strength comes to a mother when it comes to her children. It's like, you mess with my child, you mess with me, you know. But when they need us, we're, we're going to be there for them no matter what. We're going to get to them. And they, can, they will give their life for their children. A mother is courageous in the way that she stands her ground for what is right and true in spite of pressure that she may feel from outside or from within the family itself. Sometimes you get resistance from your own family, you know, trying to stand, make a stand. You know, you, you uh, get put down about it a lot of times. Rispa, she didn't think of herself or what other people would think of her. She simply did what she knew to be right for her children and remained faithful to that cause until she saw the desires of her heart fulfilled. A mother whose child is threatened with danger will most naturally rise to the occasion and protect that which has been born of her. Though she is not equipped with the most effective physical equipment to combat the enemy, she, can, she is given a natural care and concern for the child which will manifest itself in times of need. There's a story here. It says, years ago, a young mother was making her way across the hills of South Wales, and she was carrying her tiny baby in her arms, and she was overtaken by a blinding blizzard. She never reached her destination, and when the blizzard had subsided, her body was found beneath a mound of snow. They discovered that before her death, she had taken off all her outer clothing. Now, this was in a blizzard. And she wrapped the clothing about her baby. And when they unwrapped the child, 
to their great surprise and joy, they found he was alive and well. She had mounded her body over his and given her life for her child, proving the depths of her mother love. Years later, that same child, his name was David Lloyd George, and he grew to manhood and became Prime Minister of Great Britain and one of England's greatest statesmen. Determine what a woman would be willing to sacrifice in exchange for her children, and we will see the value that she places upon them. Rizba provides a picture of the woman who waited on Christ as he hung on the cross. When all the disciples had forsook him and fled, it was the women who remained openly faithful and loyal to the end until the body was finally removed from the cross. Mary, the mother of Jesus, was one of those women. She remained faithful to her son and beheld the hanging body of her son, much like Rizpa, until the body was finally taken from the cross and given a proper burial. Oh, for mothers who will value their children in life as much as Rizpa and others valued theirs in death. And a mother's legacy. The powerful effects of a mother's influence have the ability to endure through eternity. There are many well-to-do men and women who can trace their successes in life to the memory of their mother. Rizpa's legacy was one which could not affect her children for good because they were already gone. But her actions gained the attention of God himself, who sent the rain to end the drought of the judgment upon the land, and it also caught the attention of King David, who, when he heard about her, uh, her staying there with her children, he sent to have the dead properly buried. Mother, do not be discouraged. It may seem that your sacrifices may go totally unnoticed by all who are, he are near, but the God who sees in secret shall reward thee openly. One mother said, Not until I became a mother did I understand how much my mother had sacrificed for me. Not until I became a mother did I feel how hurt my mother was when I disobeyed. That's where that saying comes from when you have to chastise your children and say, it hurts you more than it does me. They don't understand that, but it does. Many times if I had to chastise my children, I, after I left, I'd go in the room and cry while they were crying in their room because I had to chastise them. Not until I became a mother did I know how proud my mother was when I achieved. Not until I became a mother did I realize how much my mother loves me. It may take time for her efforts to be truly appreciated, but they will not go unnoticed forever. And I, I'm sure uh, you mothers here have experienced the same thing, but as you, your children get older, you have a closer relationship with them because they understand more what it's like when they have had children of their own, and you kind of come friends, you know, <laughs> at that uh, when it it just changes. You relate to them better when they're uh, they've had children of their own because they understand. And another story here it says uh, the will of Henry J. Hines, you you know Mr. Hines, fifty seven Rise Hines. Uh, he, it can, he, uh, in his will, it contained the following confession. And it, this is his confession. Looking forward to the time when my earthly career will end, I desire to set forth at the very beginning of this will as the most important item in it, a confession of my faith in Jesus Christ as my Savior, 
I also desire to bear witness to the fact that throughout my life, in which there were unusual joys and sorrows, I have been wonderfully sustained by my faith in God through Jesus Christ. This legacy was left me by my consecrated mother, a woman of strong faith, and to it I attribute any success I have attained. What a blessing it was, I'm sure, you know, I don't know if, it, uh, you know, his mother may not have been still around, but but that would have been great to hear that from a child. George Washington said of his mother, I attribute, attribute all my success in life to the moral, intellectual, and physical education which I received from my mother. So we have a lot of influence on our children and our family. There was a lady, Patsy Lawson, of Running Springs, California. She left for her teaching job down in the mountain in Riverside. She was accompanied by two children, five-year-old Susan and two-year-old Gerald, which were to be dropped off at the babysitters. Unfortunately, they never got that far. Eight and a half hours later, the man found his wife and daughter in their wrecked car, upside down in a cold mountain stream. His two-year-old son was just barely alive in the 48-degree water. But in that death, the true character of a mother was revealed in a most dramatic way. When the father scrambled down the cliff, he found that his wife had given her life in the cold waters while holding her son's head just above the water in the submerged car. She died that another might live. That is the essence of a mother's love. So mothers that love their children, that are loyal, committed to their children, will go to, as far as to give their lives for their children. I know we have some great mothers in here this morning. And I hope you go home today and enjoy your family and enjoy your family, uh, your children. Enjoy every minute you spend with them. And I hope God blesses you and keeps you. That's our lesson today. If you want to take a break for a few minutes for us.